Shalom. Welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon at the Chabad House of Dalmar, together with my co-host Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service, jbiztechvalley.com, and now the columnist for the Jewish Press. And I have a column called Albany Beat, and it's uh, rewarding to show how government uh, relates to the Jewish community or doesn't, as the case may be. So this is uh, really special. I really enjoy the Jewish press. But on today's show, okay. we are the Jewish view, and there aren't that many Jewish lobbyists at the Capitol or Jewish heads of associations or trade organizations. But we have one, Jerry Geist. <laughs> He's the head of the executive director of the Association of Towns, and welcome to The Jewish View. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for inviting me here today. And uh, Jerry, tell, what's your legislative agenda? What issues are you uh, focusing on uh, this year? Well, first of all, uh, I'm the executive director of the Association of Towns, and there are 932 towns in the state of New York, and they range in quite a diversity from 34 people in Red House, New York, in western New York, and to 800,000 people out in Long Island in the town of Hempstead. So what defines a town? Like Bethlehem, that's where I'm from, that's right outside of Albany, is a town, not a city. So what defines what a town is? It's not obviously like you just said, population. No, no, it's historical. Um, so villages and cities are created uh, by s certain state authorities, and towns were here before. So um, there's no, re there's no uh, dynamic as to how a town is why is, it, why is a town set up differently with town supervisor and councilmen as opposed to villages and cities which are mayoral and common council or city council? Well, people? basically it's from the, in the statute. We have a town law statute that tells us how we are supposed to be. Uh, well, what was the origin of that, do you know? I guess it, it comes from, uh, I would say, old English law. Mm -hmm. um, and the towns have been around longest than anybody in, in, in the state, so we, we, you know, so we have, a, I guess, a long history. Um, but you asked about our agenda, yeah. and uh, local government, we believe, is the best government because it's the closest to the people. We have the most interactions with the citizenry. We deliver the most services directly to the, to the people. So we are concerned about unfunded mandates that continue to come down from Albany. Uh, in this era of the tax cap and then now the tax freeze and and we want to uh, help governments able to continue to deliver the best of services that the residents want to have and, and stay with under the ambit of all these uh, of new regulations. Are you able to consolidate services with villages, state, town, uh, cities? I mean because for example in the town of Bethlehem as Rabbi Simon mentioned uh, you know you might go down a road and the speed limit will change because it went from a town road to a state road to a, another municipal road, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're getting caught in a speed trap because you didn't, you know, it's the same road, it's one lane each way, and all of a sudden, for some unknown reason, the speed limit changed, you um, know, but, and, and also plowing and snow plowing and things like that where they have to, you know, some snow plows pick up their uh, plow to, because they don't plow a road that's not under their jurisdiction. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it, that's a great, um, great point. A couple of things. Um, because of the vagaries of state law, we have some of these issues. For example, I live in the town of North Castle back in Westchester County, and we had one road that went through two towns. And because our neighboring town, Newcastle, was considered a, a, a suburban town, they were able to regulate the speed on their road, so they had a different speed limit. We didn't have that right because we were just a regular town. And, um, and villages and cities have the right to regulate speed limits, but we don't. Mm -hmm. So we, we've always called for you know, someone looking at these uh, regulations and trying to make them so they're equal uniform. for everybody. Uniform. Yeah, uniform, absolutely. Um, so towns, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing because we're, we're always facing these obstacles that we're trying to, to modernize and to make uniform, as you said. Now, town justices don't have to be lawyers, is that correct? That's correct. But before we answer that, yes, you had asked me sure. about the consolidation thing. Okay, yes. Towns have been consolidating and, and shared service program for years. Okay. 
Because why? Because it was as good, efficient uh, businesses. You'll, you, you'll hear about highway people plowing state and county roads and highway plowing school roads, and they've been having these shared intermunicipal agreements for years. Um, but so there's this new notion that we must do this, but we've been doing it all along. And, and, and there are obstacles by state law that prevent other things from happening. So sometimes, in my town, for example, I always tell this story, we wanted to do a, a wash bay garage for school buses and highway vehicles where they could get the salt and the grime off the vehicles during the winter months. Sure. So the town board thought it was a great idea. We would save taxpayers money on both school and town side to have a shared service. But the voters in the school side voted it down. So here you had a situation where the best intentions, yet it couldn't happen. Um, so if you look historically about what towns have done, we're always interested in trying to economize and, and, and save and to uh, not have duplication of services. So this notion that we're not doing or haven't done it, and, uh, which raises a, an issue, and then we'll go back to the other issue, that under the tax freeze, they only will look <coughs> back to 2012 for shared service programs. Mm -hmm. Well, we find fault with that uh, because the recession happened in 2008, and many communities were forced to just do that, find new ways to save money. And so, and people have been doing it for years, so if you had the foresight to do a, sh a consolidation program or shared service program back in 2008, why should you be penalized by doing it right before mm -hmm. it was a problem? You should be getting credited <coughs> for that. Mm -hmm. You're right. So what's the answer when you go up to the capital and uh, mention well, this? We continue to look for carve-outs and for but I'm saying, what's the reaction when you talk to the people in the governor's office or the assembly or the Senate? What, what, what do they tell you? When they want us to find new programs and... and, 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 and they just and, ignore the issue? They ignore that They part. say they recognize it, but we're looking for new opportunities. <laughs> so, uh, but we keep reminding that, you know, you shouldn't be penalized for, for having done good quality, saving taxpayers money right along. Can you sue the state to make them, to no. force them to do that? No, no we can't. Okay. We can't do that. So, um, so we're just, we always have to be constantly reminding everybody the quality of, of services that our folks provide on a daily basis in an efficient, inefficient way. Now, you live in the town of Newcastle? North was, Castle. North Castle. My, my home is in, in Westchester, North Castle, and um, I work during the week here in Albany. Mm -hmm. um, so who are your assemblymen and senators? Uh, my state senator is George Latimer, okay. who I went to high school with, actually, oh, did you, really? in, in Mount Vernon, New York. And you look so much younger. <laughs> no, <laughs> he, he looks great. And my assemblyman <laughs> is, is David Bookwald. Uh -huh. um, so I, I've known them both quite, quite a well, long time. Well, they've both been on, guests on the show here. so They're great, they're great yeah, people. You know, I'm honored to have them. Very responsive to the community, oh, that's for sure. Fabulous. I'm, yeah. Like I said, I've known George since high school, so <laughs> it's been great. I guess what Mark is getting at, and just... You know, maybe as just a regular citizen, even though I know I'm a rabbi, but regular citizen also, certain things are just so logical to a voter, and then the government just doesn't get it. You know what I'm saying? Just yeah, yeah. that kind of, it's you know, you're saying, well, why don't you just do it? I mean, you know, it's good for everybody. There's no downside on it. And well, there's obstacles, I guess. Mark, that's what you're People kinda, want to say no for the sake of saying no you know, sometimes. It, it's frustrating because you want to, you think that you have logical arguments, and then sometimes they're, you know, what we think are logical, other people don't think are, is logical, and so um, we need to keep promoting ourselves, and hopefully that that will change some people's minds down the road. I thought Mark just was touching on another idea of maybe consolidating villages. He wanted to ask that, um, you know, well, you had two little villages, why can't you have one police department, and that would save, or fire department, at least one dispatcher, one salary would uh, take off. You know, ironically, um, consolidation, uh, every time it's put to a vote, it seems to always lose. The mm -hmm. people always want to um, have their own identity, their own local. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, the thing is, we believe in home rule, that it's let the people in their hometown, their home village, their home city decide what's best for them. Um, but, you know, it's always, it, 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 but that's what we really believe, that home rule, that the people who live in the community should decide. But believe me, that we're always looking for ways to share services. Um, another example in my town, 
we had, uh, when I was on the town board, mm. um, we had a company come to us for advanced life support for, uh, for people that needed extra immediate care that the volunteer firefighters couldn't do. And it was going to be very costly. So we found a way to do it with six other towns. And we created a, uh, a, a basically a advanced life support district over six towns. And uh, we found a way to cut the cost by 50% but provide the service. Now the irony of all that is we got it done and we have this new benefit for the community, but we had to create an ambulance district. So, you know, the governor sometimes talks about too many districts, but, right. here, but is it really about the districts or is it really about the benefit to the constituents in saving money? In this instance, I think the benefit was worth the creation of that separate district, which, mm -hmm. by the way, has no employees or no, or no uh, <laughs> cost. To no it. cost. Yeah. It's just a, a district so people can be taxed appropriately. I wanted to ask, I wanted to mention, to, at least to the audience, that <clears throat> you, that some villages and towns take in the same uh, geographic area. Well, you know, as you know, a village can only be part of a town. Part of it, but some, like Green Island, the village of Green Island, the town of Green Island have the same boundaries. That's, well, we have a whole bunch of those in Westchester. We have right. Scarsdale, Harrison, and Mount Kisco that are, they call them coterminous uh, village towns. So that's where I think some of those uh, municipalities could uh, downsize or, you know, could be eliminated. I mean, why have a village that's the same size as the town so the two just for the sake? I know that maybe upstate in Galway, you go to the town of Galway and then the village of Galway. What is, I mean, so in the actuality, what would it be? There's two Be the town of Galway. You know, do away with the village and you keep the town because the town is a large entity. They, they have elect, a, more elected officials. Well, you <laughs> know, the thing is, every, it's like I said, it's really up to the people and right. those individual communities to decide what's best for them. And, if and the, we're just talking philosophically. No, no, I understand yeah. that. But um, historically, these things have happened that way. And, if, and, and, and people can change it if they choose to, to want to do it. But I don't think the state uh, should mandate that those, let the people decide. If they want to have the, a village and a town, they should have that right. So we don't advocate for... Uh, you don't sway everybody if they want it. They want to be individualized. We, they have a little more tax because of that. It's a little bit inefficient. If they, that's well, what they, they may not even look at it as inefficient. They may think this is the best thing for them, and that's what they like. And um, well, it's sort of like having two parents, and if one parent says no, and you go to the other parent and says get the yes answer, I mean, so if you don't, you don't, the village doesn't give you the right answer. The town. Well, that's you. not necessarily so. Like, you know, <laughs> but it's the, possible. Well, but, but they each have pretty much. Uh, authority over their own right. area and but really like I said it's up to the people to decide so do you uh, so I was asking about village uh, town justices oh, about, that, yes that they don't have to be attorneys yeah if you recall there was a big story in the New York Times a few years back there was like multiple days about um, the town justice system um, and once again, that's one of the vagaries of the old. old they didn't like it. What was the gist? I didn't. Well, they were the pointing out. They were pointing out uh, that not everybody had to be an attorney. Right. And they were. They didn't like it. Mean like that. It was the like, Times is saying didn't like yeah, it. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, they, they thought they, everybody should be uh, an authorized attorney, a licensed. But you know, attorney. everybody who's a state magistrate has to uh, go through coursework. Goes through coursework, and, and they have to be. And and I believe that um, that it works. And because you could be a farmer, you could be a, a, mor a mortician, you could be an ambulance, you know, that, you know, you can be, there's, and the tow truck right. drive, there was a case in Orange County, remember Mary McPhillips? Yes. Okay. Her predecessor, when she was the county coroner, and the way she won the county coroner seat is because she, fed, she had the goods on her predecessor, the incumbent, that uh, he was a tow truck, truck driver. So whenever he went to a scene to tag the tow <laughs> of the deceased, he would tow the car away, and then he would bill for the tow. And she thought that was un, you know, unseemly. So now, she, but she, her family owned the funeral home. <laughs> so, when, <laughs> so whenever there was a death, they went to the McPhillis yeah. funeral home. <laughs> you know, in a state as large as, as us, you're going to have all sorts of stories. But, I know, but, and but that's I, what's fun about yeah, it. Yeah, that's what's great about it. But I can tell you that um, uh, you can just find as, as, as great stories about people who are, like you said, non-lawyers who, who really run a great court mm -hmm. as much as, as a, an attorney should. So 
the data doesn't uh, prove that it's not working. And, and what the data does show, that it does work, that, mm -hmm. our, our, that our justice courts really work well. It's a little like the Wizard of Oz, you know, you have a certificate, <laughs> oh, that makes you uh, show you a college <laughs> degree that you're very smart, and a person with a college degree must be stupid, you know, which, like you say, it just doesn't work out that and, you know, way. If you think about it, in, in this, they go to courses, and if there are criminal things in the justice court, they have the district attorney there, so it's, it's, it's pretty orderly, it works. And what's your background? Uh, I'm, I'm a practice. Yeah, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a licensed attorney. Oh, you okay? And uh, and, and you I, said you ran for office. That you were on the I, town board. Yeah, I, I was on the town board in my town, North Castle, for 24 years. I ran and, six times. Oh, and what party? I, I, I'm a Democrat. Oh, okay. Very um, good. Is that a Democratic town? I don't know. I'm just not when I started. Not I was when you started. I, I had I had an interesting story. I, I won the election by one vote, <laughs> and they That's called me good. landslide. And I'll never forget. My wife was pregnant with our second child, and uh, the baby was due in January. <coughs> and I said, "Look, let me run. I'll be here for the baby." And uh, elections in November. November. You didn't expect to win. Is and, that it? Uh, well, no. I thought it'll be all over in November. Oh, okay. So yeah. the the story goes that you know. We were in this very tight election, went to six courts, and um, the baby came before the election. <laughs> so uh, the headline before of the November, local, you mean? Well, no, the baby came in January, but right. my election wasn't decided until February. Yeah. <laughs> so the headline in the local newspaper wins: Geist wins, Leslie, the baby came first. You know? yeah. so, <laughs> so that's, and they called me landslide. So um, it wasn't a very democratic town, but I knocked on a lot of doors. I knocked on. 2,500 doors. Really? And, That's a lot. Um, it takes a lot of work to get elected. My family was active in politics. My father was a Republican. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the first chairman of the Westchester County Board of Legislators. So uh, we had politics in the blood, so to speak. And what made you come over to be the head of an association? After. Well, you know, I had the good fortune, as I said, of being a town board member for 24 years, mm -hmm. and I got involved with the Association of Towns. Right away, my father had told me these associations are great resources. One of the great things our association does is we help educate and train local officials. That's really one of our missions. And um, because we get all sorts of inquiries and we, people need technical assistance, all these new regulations. So, I got involved and I learned about uh, the advocacy programs, the, the training, the education, and I got to meet everybody. And I got involved with the association and I became its president. And then when the former executive director decided to retire, he asked me to uh, take it on. And that was Mr. Haber? Mr. Haber. Yeah. Um, so it's always been a... Uh, mm. I, I love the work of the association. I like working with the people. But you didn't want to staff. do it for free, so now you're getting paid to I'm, do it. I'm getting paid. It's a full-time job. job. Yes, oh, it is. yeah, yeah, more than a full-time job. But so, when you're president, you don't get paid, so no, now the, <laughs> you want to... But you know Do you what, practice law also? Or? Uh, you know, when, when I can, if, you know, if it's... Uh, for, you know, but I, I need to you know, make sure our association, that's first and foremost. But I will tell you this, yeah. that... Um, it was so important to me that Jeff's work carried on. And that Jeff Haber. Jeff Haber. And that the great organization that he created, I wanted to see it continue to grow, modernize, and uh, make sure that all the good work that he did. He was there, I think, 27 years yeah, or something. Yeah, forever. And, um, and we, want, we wanted to make sure that his good work and, and the fact that he reached out to me, I, I didn't want to let him down. You know, well, I just want to say, you, you say you're most of the week you're in, up in Albany here, but um, first of all, what I would think is with the assemblymen aren't here, what do you do? And do you go like telling all the villages, kind of like, that's why it's good that you're in towns, the Jewish Towns, towns, oh, not towns, villages, okay. Towns, sorry, so, me. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm saying that maybe go around the state and telling them or telling these boards well, we go, what I, you're I, up go, to. I go around all the state um, trying to meet with our town officials when I can. But we also do various training schools all over the state. We have finance school going on right. now. We have planning and zoning school. Uh, you know, we school have tax for the collectors. board people? I mean, yeah, we have, a, we, we have a, our main conference in February each year. We invite uh, people to come and get training. In New York City. In New York City. Now, you were telling me why, I asked you why in New York City, and you told me an interesting answer. 
it's the only place where we can get enough hotel rooms in one location. <laughs> we, we get, how many people you We get about, you know, I don't know, 1,800, 2,000 attendees. Well, with 932 we, towns. 932 towns. <laughs> you have a lot of attendees. And, <laughs> and you got a lot of attendees, and, you know, you, and we want to keep everybody in one place. It's February, you know, you can't be spread out. And New York City is the only place where we can do it, and, uh, and it works great. We, inst we instituted a, cer a certification program for our, for our attendees so they can they take certain courses in certain discipline over a couple of years. They, they can get a certificate saying they're a certified tr town official. So it's the CLE credits? Is uh, basic, well, it's the equivalent, equivalent of it for yeah. town officials. We created okay. it. Oh, good. Uh, because we feel like if people are, are going to these conferences and taking the training, they should be recognized for the, the coursework that they do on finances or planning or zoning. And Just out of curiosity, and I'm not going to ask you who or what town or whatever, but what do you find overall is the biggest issue that these town officials are lacking when they run for office and they and then they get into office and they go, oh, I didn't think of that, or I didn't know that, or, you know, they come to you for help and they say, you know, I don't want to tell my town supervisor this, or I'm in a hostile environment, maybe they're the only Democrat on a Republican board, so they want to come to you just quietly to find out, you know, the lay of the land. You know, what, what do you find is the biggest uh, problem uh, for a person, a freshman, a newly elected town official? I think the biggest um, and it was for me as well, is trying to understand what you can do in government and what you can't. You can't run government like a private business. And you have to follow the rules, and you have to have transparency, and, and you just can't say, you know, you're fired and, you know, you're hired. You, you. So I think the fact that people don't realize that it, running a government is different from running a business. And but I, if people do run, when they run, they go, you know what, if this town ran as a business, right. And, you know, and, we that, would and that's the biggest problem. People think that they can do it that way. Now, why can't they? I'm asking you. Because I mean, state, you law, state law yeah. mandates you have to do it a certain way. The controller's office has all sorts of regulations, as you know, uh, for requiring how finances are done and how they're reported and uh, when monies have to be deposited and collected and, and, and all that. So it's good. I mean, I think, and, and they run great training programs too, the controller's office. It's, they really do a great job. So I think that's the biggest problem for people getting into, into town office, not realizing what the requirements are. And that's one of the reasons why we have a newly elected training school each year. So we can go make sure when people take office that they have the tools and we can give them answers to you questions. You do it right after the election. Right February, after the election. Unless it's contested and then you don't yeah. get in yeah. office until February. Right, right. <laughs> but we do that and it's, we do it all over the state um, to help train our, our folks. And that, and that we do find is the most, uh, you know, we want to make sure they get off on the right foot because as you say, there's lots of questions they come up with. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, what's the weirdest one that you've heard? <laughs> <laughs> just, oh. that just kind of shake your head out or you use it as an example? I, 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 I mean, I can just tell you, we, I mean, this is one of my funniest stories. Okay. We were at highway school, and someone asked the following question about, uh, you know, we have to take care of the town roads, but uh, can we you know, introduce a law to require the Amish in this one area to put diapers on the horses? Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's a funny one, you yeah. know. Um, but, you know, but it shows you the types of questions you can get. You can get all sorts of types of questions. You get questions about how people are, are seated on the dais at a town board meeting. Uh, you know, do I have to sit here? Do I have to move there? You get all sorts of questions. So um, that's why we have a great staff and we help give them their <laughs> answers. It's interesting because, you know, I mean, I wouldn't know, and I am sure most of our viewers wouldn't know that, you know, everybody has an election, and that's obviously the American way, but just, you know, like Mark saying, yeah, I run a business. Okay, now I want to be a government official. Okay, now you're the government official. And, you know, it takes a little more training, and there's really probably either college courses, even, I guess, political science, but the, you know, the actual you know, working it is obviously different than Mark saying well, the theory, right. you know, in theory how government works, but you got to know this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. And this is, you know, why we have our courses. So one of our courses is, you know, uh, how does a town board meeting run and, you know, what can be done, what can't be done. Do potential candidates take those courses to find out ahead of time? No. They're not allowed to? Or? Uh, it, it, it just doesn't work that way. But could uh, they if they wanted to? Well, 
not really. I think you have to be an elected, you know, to take advantage of our courses. But I can let me let me just tell you this that you know an, 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 another another thing that you hear about is someone is a new supervisor, right. and and he doesn't like the highway superintendent mm -hmm. who's separately elected, right. and he and he's trying to tell him. You know, they so people sometimes don't understand that even if you're from the business world, now you're a supervisor, you can't just tell the highway superintendent do that road first because the highway superintendent is a separately elected individual or the town clerk, for that's example. Right. So that's, I think, the biggest uh, thing that happens is well, well, now I'm elected, now what do I do? And that's what we're here for to help give you those answers. And I'll tell you a little. Uh, well, uh, you're not going to be surprised about this, but I know you probably can't say it. The mo most of the patronage jobs comes out of the highway department. <laughs> Well, I, <laughs> and I, I, yeah, I know I'm not asking yeah. you to comment on this because it's very sensitive, but I know that there are a lot of people who want to be highway superintendent because sometimes they have more patronage jobs than the town supervisor in some places. And and that's why the highways aren't going well over here. No, no, but that's why they have the, this saying, conflict, yeah. but they also have the, um, the, it's also a jumping off point for highway superintendents if they want to do something more. You know, but I saw there wasn't there an assemblyman who went to Long Island, left his assembly seat to become a highway superintendent on Long Island. Oh, I don't know about it that. It was a couple yeah, years yeah. ago that there was an assemblyman. But, a better job. A better job. But you say no one could talk back to you. Right there. <laughs> but you know, speaking about roads, you know, one yeah. of the things that we're very concerned about is the five billion dollar uh, su settlement surplus. funds. Surplus. Well, it's not really a surplus. It's the settlement fund right. that the attorney general. One shot. Yeah. And we've been advocating that that money should be uh, a great deal of it should be reinvested in our roads, bridges culverts uh, to help us rebuild our infrastructure around the state and I know we're all very concerned about that because after the, the last two horrible winters we, mm -hmm. re we need help. The salt just rips everything. Well off. no it's, it's uh, Hurricane Lee and Sandy and, and all of the, I mean look at what in Albany County in the hill towns the, uh, they're suffering out there because it really shifted the river the, the streams and also in Schoharie right. County, Pete Lopez has been the assemblyman there. Has been uh, after the FEMA to you know regrade the stream so that they could run more uh, efficiently. Well, it's very important because under the tax cap, you know, the the opportunity to you know raise taxes to do this is not there. Mm -hmm. So we're asking now the state has this. One time. Is it, wasn't it taken care of in the budget, or I mean, again, just the basic uh, story. In the I budget, know. they, uh, the governor and, and the uh, state legislature allocated the money, uh, but it didn't go as far. Right. Uh, they as, spent it already. Then. Well, we, we, you know, we're hoping that we can address it. Address right. It. And now, in just the few minutes we have left, I was just opening the floor to you. Is there something we didn't ask about that you wanted to talk about and mention? And well, I, I just think that it's always good to uh, be reminded of the dedication and the hard work that local officials do on an on everyday basis. Um, and that what's great about town government is that when people have a problem, they can call, they can walk in, and they have that direct contact uh, with, with someone who's from their neighborhood, their town, their kids go to school together. And, and I really think that's a great... Uh, byproduct of our system, and uh, I love going around the state, meeting town officials, and, and learning about how they do things, and and uh, the serve. And and every year when I went to the conference in New York, I always came back with a new idea that I could bring back, whether it was getting LCD lights for the parks, or or learning how a better way to uh, uh, do payroll servicing. Or you things. see, I think potential candidates should be able to take those courses because then they may get a reality check and they might be able to say, you know what, maybe I shouldn't run. Maybe I'm not the best person. Maybe I don't know enough of what I should know. Or maybe you should have a separate class just for potential candidates so they could have a, an, a way of dipping their toe in the water. You may get better candidates. Well, we have a lot of our information up on our website, nytowns.org. Yeah. But I will tell you this, we do so many schools throughout the year trying to train just the elected officials know, and the appointed officials, it's hard. How, how many staff do you have? Uh, we have nine, nine people. Three, Plus you. Th yeah, three lawyers. Um, and uh, they work so hard. Mm -hmm. And they're so dedicated to the work that they do and for the, for the members that we represent. Well, theoretically, it, maybe you should have, maybe you should just keep it in the 
on the side, you know, as another idea. <laughs> no, no, we always will welcome ideas. Because but that's the one thing that I find is fascinating is how the poor quality of candidates of, you know, people just think that they could put their name on a ballot and that, you know, they get elected and then they're like, well, now what do I do? I didn't think I'd win. <laughs> well, And that had, believe me, I've heard but, that more than once. So. But what, what, what Jeff Haber left me was a great staff. And yes. more importantly, he told me the key is making sure you get a staff that's going to stay. Right. The longer they stay, everybody's going to feel more comfortable when they deal with your office. Oh, I, I, I spoke right. to so-and-so last time. And, and that continuity is so important. And that's one of the things that we really try to maintain and, and work Absolutely. on. Absolutely. You're very smart. That's very good. You know, Mark, that, uh, that we, it was very informative. Like I say, I'm a rabbi, but in, in the, I am a citizen and I care about our community. And uh, that we very much appreciate that you being on the Jewish view and telling our viewers what good government should be and what it's all about. Thank you very much. Continue your good work with a lot of success and good health. And Thanks, thank Jerry. you very much and thanks for having me. Thank you.